thank you all for coming. I'm in the Department of History at Vanderbilt University, my one and only job straight out of college. So I have had a wonderful experience there and I'm now uh, working on uh, my own research, which this is today, but also on a number of important, I think, uh, digital preservation projects, which I've slipped in a few slides about at the end around different parts of the world where these records are disappearing as we're sitting here talking together today. So that'll uh, sort of wrap up and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how I got started on this. I graduated at the University of Florida. I was going to be working on Brazil and I came across some wonderful records in their Caribbean collection at the University of Florida and it was runaway slaves from the Carolinas and Georgia coming into Spanish Florida and asking the Spanish government to receive them and grant them sanctuary. And immediately I was hooked. And so from that time forward, I switched away from Brazil and went into the Spanish Caribbean, which is actually where I grew up. So I was meant to find that record, I guess. So, um, so today I'm talking about a project that I began as a graduate student 20 something years ago um, on that discovery and it has morphed into now a National Historic Landmark, a museum, um, film projects, school projects, all sorts of things and the community has adopted it so it's really wonderful uh, outcome of scholarly research to give it back to the community and to um, bring to light a history that I think not many people know um, because if you have any history of African American history in your school uh, curriculum. It's almost always something that starts in 1619, the English version, 1619, bedraggled slaves getting off a boat in Jamestown, uh, and that's the beginning of the narrative. I'm going to take you back over a century earlier to the very first Africans to explore what is today the United States. They are free and enslaved. I'll race through that to get to my time period, the 18th century. But I just want to blow away the old narrative of 1619, okay? And we're going to start way back. We're going to start on the Iberian Peninsula where some of these different patterns are created. So um, if this is not the Puritans and the Pilgrims, they're wonderful, but that is a different narrative and this one is new, hopefully, to you all. So I put that up all the time when I'm talking to people so that it'll maybe <laughs> burn into your memories. Not 1619 sound and not enslaved. Uh, and this image also helps my classes, uh, you know, get that idea that in the Iberian Peninsula, which was a Catholic uh, peninsula, uh, there was a whole different attitude about slavery because their legal system is based on the Roman law and that goes back centuries before, whereas the English system is Anglo-Saxon chattel or property law. It privileges property. But in the Roman legal system, anybody could become a slave. You could be enslaved if you were not killed on the battlefield, if you were terribly in debt and sold yourself into slavery. You could be condemned into slavery by the state for some crime. All of these ways you could become a slave, but it was not racial and it was not perpetual. And those are the two big messages today, okay? Different legal, well, that's three. Different legal system, not racial, not perpetual. Many ways to become a slave and many ways to get out. You could buy your way out. There were systems of self-purchase. You could be freed by a master. You could have the state free you for some good service, such as military service and defense of the community. So it's a fluid legal condition, not a racial condition. Very, very different than what we're taught in the American uh, narrative, okay? And so this image helps you remember that, that this African man from the 13th century is being baptized into the Catholic Church, a very incorporative, inclusive institution. Everybody will become brothers in Christ, whether you were a Jew, Muslim, heretic, whatever. As long as you convert, you are in the, in the brotherhood. And um, so he has a white priest and white godparents bringing him into the church. And were I to go back to the locale where he was baptized, I would find sacramental records that are not supposed to be destroyed. They're religious records, baptismal records. And this idea gave me the way to track a lot of the people that I work on through the Catholic Church records that are kept as long as possible. 
And then another uh, image to sort of throw off the narrative from what you might have had is that for almost 800 years, the Muslims and the Christians in the Iberian Peninsula and a little bit up into France uh, battle for control. And sub-Saharan Africans joined in the Muslim effort. Uh, so you will see this image is one in which the Muslims won. There are many images in which the Christians win. But again, to show you that this was a religious war that went on forever, and it certainly made the Spaniards obsess on the divide is religious, not racial. Okay, another message. And so, imagery. And you see they're taking off the, the sheep and the cattle and the captives are all part of the ransoming system, the economy that ran that war for 800 years. And so hopping over a couple centuries now to get us to uh, the discovery of the New World by Christopher Columbus, 1492. Spain, by virtue of having given him the charter to do it, claims the whole world, the whole new discovered world. And Portugal complains, and the Pope gives most of Africa to Portugal and the New World to Spain. From that point on, Spain is launching expeditions of discovery. And uh, these are the ones that I just threw up here because I'm going to focus on Florida. They all come in through Florida. Every one of these expeditions included free and enslaved Africans. So they're some of the various, very earliest explorers in what is today the United States from 1513. Now, that's more than a century before 1619 Jamestown, right? Okay. Here are some of the routes that these explorers took through Florida. And uh, because I went to school there, I was fortunate to hook up with a lot of the archaeologists that do the work that also amplify my history. So I work through text primarily, but they work through material culture, digging it up out of the ground. And it really changed the way I look at history and work. And I was very much enriched by all the mentors I had there. And I look at art as well for evidence because, you know, I'm working on the people from below that don't often have the chance to write the grand narratives that are retained in the fine libraries. But they write in the Spanish system, in that political world. I gave you the religious difference, but the political difference is that everybody that's a subject of the king or the queen has a right to voice, has a right to write. And if they can't write, somebody else can write for them. And that paper trail has to be given up eventually to the monarch for, for a decision. So I have enslaved women, the doubly disempowered, writing to, directly to the king. It's a personal kind of corporate relationship that they have. And a good government, meaning if you're a good monarch, you should listen and hear everybody. Um, you had a family that the God gave the monarchy to the king. Below that, there's a layer of, you know, the elite nobles. Below that, they're uh, the clerics. Below that, everybody else. And the slaves at the bottom, but part of the family and have right to voice. So it leaves me lots of paper trails. And this is an odd one, but I found there are quite a few Aztec codices of my first free black explorer of Florida. The gentleman you see in the slide is named Juan Garrido. And he was with uh, the very earliest expeditions to Española, which is today the Dominican Republic. From there, he branches out to Puerto Rico with Juan Ponce de Leon. And from there, they branch up to Florida in 1513. After that, he goes on the conquest of Mexico with Hernando Cortez, and the Aztecs painted him in several different codices. And he's always right up there with Cortez uh, in the expedition. He was from West Africa, he came through Portugal, into Spain, and then out into the Americas. And he's literate, and he writes directly to the king to tell him about his adventures and all the services he performed for the king of Spain, to Puerto Rico, to Española, to Florida, to Mexico. In Mexico, he says, I buried the dead, I planted the first wheat, I made a chapel. All of this is recorded. We know about his wife and children from this period on, 16th century. And then finally, in the middle of the 16th century, 1565, after several of those failed expeditions don't make a permanent town, uh, finally Pedro Menendez de Aviles makes St. Augustine. Have any of you ever been to St. Augustine? 
Okay, if you go back to St. Augustine, you'll see right outside the city walls is Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mose, my town. And I want you to see it if you go back, please. All right, so I started doing research on the earliest Africans in Florida after veering away from Brazil. And I started finding all these little paper trails. And eventually they made a museum exhibit of my research. And uh, so we do not know what Juanillo looked like at all. This is an artist's idea of it. But Juanillo, um, I found in a wonderful old book about an expedition up to St. Helena, Paris Island in Carolina, and no discussion of him, but I found a picture of a document that I read, and there was this reference, and it was he, and he was a translator who had shipwrecked on the uh, coast of Florida, had lived among the Indians for eight years before Pedro Menendez de Aviles gets to make a town. And when he went exploring his new domain, he finds Africans that had been living among the Indians whom he tries to ransom back and bring back into the Christian fold. And Juanillo went with him. Others decide to stay with the Indians and live instead with the families they've created there. So Juanillo had lived eight years among the Indians, so he's really valuable. He has all the language and cultural knowledge that the Spaniards are gonna need to be able to deal with these new Indian groups. And so he's enlisted in the militia and he appears on these military roles. And he's in Florida for a number of years before he finally goes back to Hispaniola, which were I to continue to track him, I'd have to go back there. Another gentleman I found in some of these records is also in a free black militia. Every one of these um, places that I study anywhere in Latin America, there were militia groups of Spaniards, of Indians, and of Africans, and those records are also some of the best I have, so I never imagined I'd be a religious or military historian, but those records are kept, and so they give me some trails to follow. And the Free Black Militia in St. Augustine was created in 1681, and so we have lists of who was in it and who were the officers and so on. This gentleman was one of the officers, a corporal. He's also a free mulatto man who owned a store in St. Augustine, so we have various little tidbits about him, and so they drew him for one of the museum characters. And then we have some scoundrels, too. Juan Merino was uh, convicted of some crime in Havana and gets sentenced as an exile to St. Augustine, but he's a very valuable acquisition because he's an ironsmith, and every military uh, fort needs an ironsmith to do all the weaponry repair and so on. And so he's sent as a convict, but he ends up as, as a free man with his own store running uh, an ironsmithing business. And Juan Merino is another character we sort of highlight. Now, we can't just make it all men. Even the women are harder to track in these records. Uh, Isabel de los Rios was a woman who had her own little business baking and would go and sell these little cakes out in the community. And because she was involved in some commercial exchanges and some challenges, uh, I find her in the records. So Isabel is also introduced. And if you haven't been to St. Augustine, you'll see this big, huge fort there. It is part of the Circum-Caribbean Defense Network for all the silver fleets that are coming out of Mexico and Peru and headed back to Spain. So there's not any wealth in Florida per se. It's, it's important because of strategic location. You have to pass there to take a right and go to Spain on the way back with the silver. So big fort there, and that means you need soldiers to man it and that sort of thing. So it gives my free black community another way to perform service and be recognized militarily with weaponry, with uniforms, with honor, as you know, there's a masculinity thing going on here in the Spanish world too, as you may know. So, you know, military service is prized. So big fort. And then, uh, I, I mentioned that I found some documents that led me this trail. People had been, run, uh, I should say, Florida used to be, in the Spanish idea, everything from Key West to Newfoundland and west to the mines of Mexico. Now, they had no clue what that really meant, but they claimed the whole Atlantic coast. And darned it, the English didn't come in, the slip into Charleston in 1670 and create a settlement. And from that moment on, there's a lot of warfare between English in Carolina, Spanish in St. Augustine, and warfare also 
although horrible, is an opportunity for my free black militias and my Indian militias to show their uh, stuff. And so from 1670 on, the English are coming up from the Caribbean where they've already established their Anglo-Saxon chattel law, property is all, and their racial divide, black and white, and that slavery is now a property issue and it is not a criminal uh, condition, it's a property issue which will pretty quickly get associated racially with Africans. And so they're coming from Barbados and Jamaica already with this idea of very harsh slavery that they're going to bring in. And it's going to be perpetual, and it's going to be racial, and they're going to put it up there in Carolina in 1670. Well, if you'd been somebody brought up there in 1670 under those conditions and ideas, and you knew from the Indians and others around you there was a different system down the road, uh, you'd run for it too. And so from 1670, probably people are running. But the earliest I found were from 1687 in a canoe, two men, three women, and a nursing child risked all their lives to get to St. Augustine. And they're the first ones that I can document because the Carolinians are after them. And they're sending all sorts of complaints to the Spanish government. I want back. And they list the people. And the Spanish are receiving them in and saying, well, we have to give them sanctuary. It's part of what you do for miserable people. You know? And that's orphans and women and needy people. So they've been receiving runaways, at least I can document, from 1687. And the governors in Florida don't know what to do. The English are getting hostile. What should we do with these people? Eventually, the king has to make a new policy. And this is it in 1693. Uh, and I gave you a little quote of it, giving liberty to all the men as well as the women, because I had my women running down there too, uh, so that by their example and by my liberality as a good Christian king, others will do the same. Now, it sounds very good, and it is a religious requirement of him to receive people that want to be converted to Catholicism, but it's also a political move and a military move to drain slaves from the English and potentially use them as attackers on the way back, which is what they do. So a little bit about Saint, o I mean about Charleston is starting to, to develop a little bit of a city. It looks sort of like the ones in St. Augustine, a wall around it and a few buildings. And this is the earliest map we have for uh, Charleston from 1711. And all this time, runaways are coming into St. Augustine uh, a couple at a time, six or seven at the most at a time, but they're being housed around the community until there's finally enough people to actually sort of sustain a population in a little town. Here's some of the runaway images that we have from Eng English sources. Um, and so in 1715, there's a big Indian war in Charleston. It almost wiped out the, the uh, white population of Charleston. It's called the Yamasee War, if any of you are from Carolina. And uh, that opportunity of a major Indian war when the whites are fleeing to the boats in Charleston Harbor means that some of those slaves rise up and join the Indian cause and fight for a couple of years to get their freedom. And when they're finally defeated, because extra troops come from uh, New York and Virginia to help out the English planters, then when the Yamasee are defeated, they head to south, south to St. Augustine too. So in come, in 1716, a group of Yamasee Indians and Africans. And of those, one of my primary, uh, someone I'm now writing a biography on, is baptized as Francisco Menendez. I do not know what his African name was, what the English people called him, what the Yamasee Indians called him. But when I find him in the baptismal records, he takes the name of his godparent, his white godparent, a very important uh, treasurer of the Spanish government, has recognized in him something special. Uh, his military ability is certainly something that's going to be rewarded. But the rest of the blacks that came with him also recognize him as their leader. And so in the Spanish idea, you recognize what they call natural lords the Indians or the Africans that have the power among their own community, much easier to let them run the show as long as they're loyal Catholics and help you. Okay? So Francisco Menendez is my new leader of the runaways who's going to make the new town that we're going to see, the first free black town in what is today the United States. 
They all had to go to the government house. If you go to St. Augustine today, you can see the government house. It has a nice museum inside. And they had to say why they were there and what they wanted. And then the governor made paper on them. And then they get free. And so here's a little map of St. Augustine is the walled pink spot in the middle. But all around there, you'll see little Indian villages and so on near the city. And my town is way up here. Gracia Real is out there on the front lines where the English are going to come running in to hit, right? So they're going to defend it. It makes sense politically and militarily for the Spanish to do it. And they categorize these people, the Indians and the Africans, as new Christians. The thing is, you got to convert them. You put a Franciscan priest out there with them, start teaching them the Catholic faith, and, uh, and then leave them alone to run their own show, their own towns. And so some of the things that I found the Africans were doing, they did all their own plantings, of course, and a lot of fishing. But they're also the cowboys in, uh, in Florida and many other places in Latin America, in Venezuela and Argentina, where there are great big plains. Uh, the Dominican Republic and Jamaica, all these places had black cowboys. And so the Florida Agricultural Museum recently did a wonderful exhibit on black cowboys in Florida. Still in Ocala, there are many black families that were always cowboys and still are today. Um, and so that's a little bit of imagery of what the houses and so on would have looked like out in the areas near that town. Um, and to remember that cowboying is one of the skills. All right, well, jumping a little bit forward, the town has just gotten started in 1738. In 1739, a war, a strange war breaks out called the War of Jenkins' Ear. If you ever remember that from a long time ago, your history. There, were, there was hot war and cold war all through the 18th century between the Spanish and the English. And some of it's on land, and some of it's on the water. So corsairing or privateering is like a legal government-sponsored pirate, basically. And they're raiding up and down all of these places. And in one of the Spanish events, uh, this gentleman with the big sword on the left is Leon Fandino. He takes one of the Englishmen and cuts off his ear. Robert Jenkins' ear gets cut off. Well, Robert Jenkins trots his ear back to the Parliament in <coughs> London, and it becomes a very famous cut off ear uh, because it rallies the English to wage more war against Spain. So it becomes known as parochially the, as the War of Jenkins' Ear, 1739. <laughs> But it's a global war, so I made fun of it. But it does take a lot of money and resources and ships. And it's all over Latin America, the English trying to defeat the Spanish at big forts like the one you saw, and all over Cartagena, Portobello, these big, all that whole circle of forts that we said were supposed to protect the silver fleet are now the uh, way that the, Span I mean, the English are going to try to attack. So there's old Jenkins. Well. It turns out Leon Fandino was recruiting people from Florida to go on his privateering legal piracy attacks on North Carolina. And guess who one of them is? Francisco Menendez. Francisco Menendez joins the Fandino uh, expeditions. He goes on a number of these routes back up to North Carolina. Doesn't it make sense? He knew South Carolina. And so he's on these uh, expeditions. And we, we find some of them at Ocracoke and other places on the North Carolina coast, where they're picking up supplies for St. Augustine in the middle of the war. It's hard to get supplies into St. Augustine. They're having famines and so on. So if you can grab a bunch of rice from South Carolina or a bunch of tar and naval stores, you take it down to St. Augustine. You've helped your community by this legal piracy. So here's some of the uh, art images, because the English went into this in a big way. Lots of money, lots of <coughs> ships, lots of paper trail. Military events also generate all these paper trails. And the English were the winners at Portobello in Panama, one of the big fortification places and a big silver fair, what happened there. They win that one. So you can see sort of the ships. But the next one is Cartagena, and that one, the Spanish win. But I look at some of the early English language newspapers in Philadelphia and New York, and they, because they were so cocky after they won at Portobello, they're saying, and we won at Cartagena, and they're reporting a great victory. And it wasn't one. It was a failure, in fact. So they have to retract that. So Cartagena is the next one. 
And the big hero at Cartagena is this Admiral, San uh, Blas de Leso, is his name, Admiral Blas de Leso. He's uh, the head of the whole Spanish Navy, poor one-eyed, one-armed guy, a uh, one-legged, one-eyed guy who's uh, very old and at the time wins this huge victory. And so there's statues of him all over Cartagena. But remember the name Blas de Leso for a minute because in 1740, this War of Jenkins' Ear hits our southeastern Atlantic states. And in Georgia and South Carolina, the English raise all these troops to send on a major attack down to St. Augustine to try to be part of this war and finally get rid of those Spaniards, those Catholics, those Papists down in Florida. So they send a big bunch of armies down there that include Indians, Englishmen, Scott Highlanders from Carolina, Georgians, a whole crew, and some black uh, helpers as well. They come in to attack St. Augustine by land as the Royal Navy also comes up from Jamaica. So it's a major two-pronged event on St. Augustine, little pitiful St. Augustine. And it's led by General James Oglethorpe from Georgia that some of you may have seen some of the you know, historical sites that he has in Georgia. So you can see the map of the Royal Navy coming up, all those ships trying to get in to attack St. Augustine, and coming overland with Oglethorpe are all the Carolinians and Georgians. Well, where did they hit first? My little town out there on the front lines, Gracia Real de Santa Teresa. So there's a big battle there. The uh, black inhabitants of the town had already moved in to the safety of the big fort, but they go out to help get rid of the invaders, and so they fight uh, in the beginning of June 1740 to recover uh, their old home place, and they do defeat the, the, Span uh, the Scots and the English. And so this is a very dramatic drawing. The fort I can testify for because we've done it archaeologically, but I had to tell the artist, no, 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 they didn't wear dreads <laughs> in 1740. <laughs> Anyway, so my Menendez, again, appears. He's like, you know, a force Gump. He's in all of these events. I start finding him. So he's at the Battle of Mose, and he helped retake Mose. And so, remember, we have a voice. We can write directly to the king. He writes a series of letters to the king detailing all of his service. Those are always covered by the governor of Florida, always uh, saying, yes, he deserves it. He's been a wonderful uh, you know, assist to us, and he deserves it. He wants a better position, a better captaincy, and he wants a better pay. And the Spanish king didn't answer his letter. And so he says, so since he didn't answer, I'm going to get on one of these corsairs, and I'm going to go to Old Spain and see him myself and ask. So it's while he's on one of these corsairing expeditions, he gets picked up by an English uh, ship coming out of Rhode Island that had stopped in New York. In 1741, you may have read a wonderful book by Jill Lepore, The Great Negro Plot. Um, she's at Harvard, and she wrote a, 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 a nice, you know, popular kind of book about this event. In New York, they believed in 1741 that the Spanish blacks that lived among them, that had been captured in all of these wars and brought back, were the intestine enemy, and that they were going to rise up, and Spain was coming too, and they were going to take New York. And probably not true, but then they execute a priest, they execute a number of blacks, burning them at the stake with their crucifixes in their hands. They execute an Irish family that were the tavern owners where the blacks were well known. So everybody gets swept up in this frenzy and a bunch of horrible executions right there in New York, 1741. Darned if I couldn't have written this plot. The ship, the Revenge, that has come out of Rhode Island, stopped in New York to pick up more sailors. They needed some more men. And the guys on the ship witness all of this burning at the stake business. So what do they do when they capture my guy, Francisco Menendez, on the water? They torture him to get political and military information from him. They, it's a gruesome thing. They tie him on a cannon. They whip him. They pretend they're going to castrate him. It's a horrible thing, and it's recorded a number of ways. The lieutenant on the ship recorded it. Interrogations later, a, newsprint, a newspaper picked up this story because it was so dramatic. And they take my Francisco Menendez to the Bahamas 
to an admiralty court there that they want to say he's just another prize. He couldn't be a free man. Look at the color of his skin. And so they sell him as a slave in the Bahamas along with all the stuff that was in the ship. And I'm still searching for the admiralty court records there because I know he countered some of that. He was a very literate and persuasive person. All I have so far is the English account in the Bahamas of this lieutenant who wrote it down. And he talks about the cursed seed of Cain and so on. You can just look at him and know he's a slave. So what my Francisco said, I have yet to find out. But I'm on the trail, so. Now how he got back to Florida, eventually, I don't know. The Spanish always tried to ransom back their captives. Remember, we said this was one of the obligations. There are Christian subjects, I have to get them back from these Protestant heathens, you know, and they would call everybody Lutherans. So uh, they would always try to ransom them back. And in the New York Admiralty Court records, I found a series of these recoveries of uh, free black people that had been enslaved and sold out into the countryside of New York sometimes. And I found one case from 1752 where the governor of Havana goes and gets all those baptismal records for those black sailors, tells all of the people to gather them up, and he sends them to New York as proof that they're born free and they should be free. And um, Governor George Clinton of New York, that you may have read about or heard about, finds only two of the people and recovers them and they do come back. But the others, we don't know what happened to them. But in other words, Spanish governors felt it their responsibility to bring back their people no matter what color they were. Catholics, you, re you rescue them. And one of the quotes in that case that where I was uh, watching what was going on in New York said, without those of broken color, that means anybody that's not pure Spanish, you could be any mix of any kind, we wouldn't be able to man our navies. And so that's another practical reason they try to get people back. And then this is a, uh, an image to just remind you that all anywhere in Latin America, you will find military records for free people of color all the way to the Philippines if you want to, because that's a Spanish colony too, to California, to Mexico, to Patagonia, you would find black militiamen incorporated. Some of them get very formal uniforms like this and, and they have legal rights that the regular people don't have not to be tried by uh, a regular court, only by a military court of their peers, for instance. No tribute must be paid and a certain amount of privileges and status go with this. And then there are the black pirates that you can start to find a few of them. And one was so famous from Puerto Rico that he, they made a novel about him, so Manuel the Pirate. Okay, well, Mose was destroyed in that battle where the man with the dreads was, and the first fort. So it is reestablished in 1752, and somehow by 1759, I find Francisco Menendez back there. I still have to fill in how he got back. He might have escaped, he might have argued his way out, the Spanish might have bought him back and freed him that way. I don't know, I'm still working on it. But they did create another town, rebuilt it. Uh, everybody is a free subject of the Spanish crown. They run their own uh, towns as the Indian villages were also run, 1752. In the interim, they had just been living in St. Augustine, so I'm also tracking what people were doing in that interim period, interregnum between the two uh, towns. Um, but this is what the archaeologists and the military engineers and my text uh, research produced. Is This is the best we know of what the town would have looked like. Not a big, huge thing. It's a couple of miles north of the city fort. Uh, you get to and fro it on the water. Uh, and there were um, fields all around it. And, and that's mosey. This is it today because um, it's out now sort of in a, you know, landscapes and geography changes. We see these climate changes happening. A lot of water came up. It's now in a sort of marshy area, um, but it's out on a little hammock, you know, as a raised area with a lot of brush on it. And so that's where they were digging. And so they superimposed the little fort on where they were digging, you know, drew it on there so you could see about where it was. And part of it had actually been washed away into the water, so some things were retrieved from the water right next to it. And we even had NASA do overhead aerial uh, photography of it, so infrared 
photographs of it can also show you things. Uh, in this one, that line out to the little hammock is actually just because the archaeologists walked out there every day and left a trail. But you can see a sort of a, a square on one corner there that might look a little not natural, and it matches up with the maps that I was able to find. So as a graduate student, they sent me back to Spain to do the research for this project, and what an opportunity that was. And then with all that I brought back, uh, they began the process of the dig. Excuse me, before you leave that slide? Yes. So I see the water, and then I see what looks like a river at the bottom. Could you point to the picture? Oh, yes, I'm sorry, I'm pointing it through. <laughs> Uh, yes, that sort of purpley river is the one you would take into St. Augustine. That little thing is the hammock, and where the red is, is more stuff, you know, more that they can dig at. So, but that's, that was the town, that's Moza? Yes, that's the second little town. And then the little line going up to, that's the mainland up there? Yes, that would be the mainland, but you could also come the river way. Oh, okay. We walked through, the you'd have to put on high, yeah, marsh. Have to put on a boots and so hike. So the Atlantic Ocean is on our right, right there. It would be this way. Oh. I think it's this way, because if we're walking that way to town. Oh no, I'm sorry. That way. I'm dyslexic. <laughs> it's that. Thank you. So uh, we got. Uh, got this is Representative Bill Clark of the Florida Black Caucus of the State Legislature. To, took interest in this and got us the funding that funded the next two seasons of digs. And Dr. Kathleen Deegan is the curly blonde hair in the middle. And then volunteers from the community and students. Uh, on the right is a student she brought up from Haiti to work on this site because I don't know if you've read any of her work in National Geographic, but she was the main archaeologist for all the Columbus sites, La Navidad, La Isabella, and so on. And so she thought Haitian students that worked with her there should also know about the African-American uh, work we're doing on this side. And so they, they were also involved in our dig. And there are some of the students down in the pits digging out stuff to carefully record it. And um, not a lot of you know fancy stuff, of course. This is a, a little fort out in the boondocks, I mean, two miles out. Uh, military place, sh uh, brief occupation, that's going to make a difference about how much stuff can you actually find. But here's some of the things that we found, you know, it's a military place. There were women and children, too, out in the houses outside. Um, they were making bones out of, I mean, buttons out of bones, smoking different types of pipes, a lot of pottery was found, glass is found. Um, those are the things that survive. So textiles and things like that we lose, but hard stuff, metal stuff we keep. And uh, that one at the top, I'm going to show you a better one. Oh, lots of pottery and military stuff, all people's uniforms, right? Oh, lots of bottles too, apparently wine drinking was... <laughs> And this was my favorite one. This one uh, actually washed into the water next. But um, it's supposed to be St. Christopher carrying Jesus over the water on his shoulders. And um, so the many studies of, of African American culture and African culture throughout the Americas, if you study the Congo and Gola people, they believed in a cosmogram that was a, a circle. So life is just one half of it. The bottom is death, and then you'll come up again. And on the, while you're in the underworld, it's a white, watery underworld. And so references to underwater things are very common all throughout anywhere Congo Angola people were, which is all our southeast, from Carolina, Georgia, Florida, all in the islands. And so in Fernandina Beach, if any of you have ever been there, I went and looked at uh, burials there, they're all lined with conch shells on the Graves will be references to water and conch shells and things, and it's so St. Christopher seems like a good match for that if you're going to put things together. But he's also the patron saint of travelers, and they had the idea to go back home someday. And then he's also the patron saint of Havana, Cuba, where these guys on their ships were going back and forth. So all of my people from Florida also knew Havana. And then we finally got together all this information after two years of digs and my research, and then we had our first exhibit at the Florida Museum of Natural History. Um, there used to be some hubbub about this when uh, 
the Smithsonian was interested in having a little exhibit about it and I had to go talk up there and they didn't like that I had the Mina face here. This man is a Mina person from modern day Benin uh, because of the scarification. Now this is way back 1991 and they thought that would be a reference to savagery or backwardness or something. I said everywhere I go that's there, you know, that's what people had so I don't think of it that way. But anyway, we put together our little first museum and then eventually it went all around the country and millions of people saw it and then eventually after all that touring of it, we gave it back to the community as part of our return to the community in St. Augustine. And uh, then we went through the paperwork that you have to go through to get it named a National Historic Landmark and it was named that so that nobody could buy this property and build condos all over this historic place. So that's the ceremony. And then I used to pepper them with things at the state <laughs> about why aren't you, no, you know, paying attention to this. And finally, Governor Jeb Bush did. And so he came out to d dig the first shovelful for the museum that they finally created there. And there's that ceremony. And there's my mentor, Kathy, in the back. And now, if you go there, uh, it is totally marked and nobody will develop it and ruin it and there's signage everywhere and it tells a little bit of the history. Um, and they have a little museum there where in Florida, the fourth graders have to do state history. So all the fourth graders come in and, and it's just really wonderful. They do artwork and projects about the stuff they learn about and it's up in the, there's a little visitor's film and then there's the objects that we discovered and all kinds of activities happen out there now. Recreations of the battle, everybody dresses up either in kilts or Indian gear or Spanish uniforms and shoot at each other. <laughs> and there they are. This is the Fort Mosa Historical Society that has been created in the town and uh, they take it very seriously, all the research I do, they try to, you know, stay true to it. They're trying now to raise money to build one of the redoubts so that people can see what the fort looked like. And the man on the left is my friend Robert who plays Francisco Menendez. He really has adopted this identity. And then uh, I mentioned I'm going to slip in a, a quick plug because these documents that I found, these little bits of life that I've been finding and piecing together, like those broken pots, I try to piece back things. Um, they're dropping out of existence as we're sitting here. So I, I got the idea of trying to raise funds and grants and go around and take my students with me also to digitally preserve these oldest records. The people at the University of Florida where I went to school we're already doing that with big heavy microfilm equipment. So my first trip was to Cuba in 1991 as a student and I saw how it worked and I knew it needed preserved and eventually now we have little tiny digital cameras that are not a lot of equipment or money and we just, we, we jokingly call it guerrilla preservation because some of the places <laughs> we go are pretty sketchy and you know, it, you know, you don't tell your family where you're going on some of these things, but then you bring it back and you upload it and it's all on the Vanderbilt uh, website now and I've gotten more and more grants. So we started uh, first, you know, as I said, when I was a student, but then they were always filming the Spanish people that left, Cuba, left Florida eventually to go to Cuba when the English come and take Florida over. So there's a big exodus and my Francisco Menendez goes to Cuba with everybody. All the people from Mose end up in Cuba, which is why I went to Cuba. And um, so it was a little difficult, you know, because of the politics of that day to get money and permission to get to go. Um, but we managed, I, we just kept pushing at it. And then finally National Endowment for the Humanities gave me some money and we did Cuba and Brazil, two big African places. And that was our beginning. So uh, I built on the knowledge that I had from those Spanish records and I moved to the African Indian records and since then we've been going to Colombia and Brazil and adding to the documentary base all the time. The British Library has a program called the Endangered Archives Program now which has been giving me grants recently. I just wrote my last letter of support for one of my former grads today who's going to do a new project in Cuba. And so um, but what, I, what we do is once we get the funding, we also train the students in the areas 
Uh, we support them with stipends. They preserve their own history. And we put it on these huge servers that you know, they give me space on at the university. And then anybody around the world can access these records. So it's democratizing this knowledge, this precious knowledge, because people don't always get the money to travel like I do to these places. And so they can sit anywhere. And if they've got an internet connection, they can do research on this project. Yes? So when they, when they escaped to, to Cuba, after they left Florida, or they escaped to Cuba, um, did they form a community that was, did they, did they just kind of, in, how would I say, move in and did they create a separate community or did they kind of? I'm, I'm filling in that story for my biography of Menendez, but for the first year, they live in a little, there's, there's no place to receive them. There's not like a you know, refugee center or anything. So everybody gets, but they're Christian Spanish subjects. They have to be protected and taken care of. So the Spanish government gives them an, uh, daily rations and stipends. They find houses for them. And I found that Menendez lived in a little town across the bay from Havana called Regla. Um, and my Spanish Indians mostly end up in a little town across the bay called Guanabacoa. And uh, they live there for a year until finally a big planter gives a big chunk of land out in Matanzas province. And they all get land grants. Everybody gets seeds and supplies to start up a new homestead on the frontier like they did here. And each one of my Mose villagers also gets an African slave recently introduced into Cuba to help them on the... So you see, it's not a racial system. It's a juridical system. And how, what the relationship is like, I don't know. But I, I have no idea yet. Um, but they start um, their own homesteads in Matanzas. So I have maps in my first book, was called Black Society in Spanish Florida. And I worked out the maps about where everybody got the land grants. But it's out in a rough area. They didn't have a lot of support there. And, and Menendez was an urban man. Remember, he's literate in at least I don't know how many languages. And he, I have an idea, must uh, he eventually gives up the land, because I see him making his payments to the crown for the land, and for the slave, and for the seeds, and for the whatever. And then he's not in Matanzas anymore. So I think he's gone back to the big city of Havana, and that's where I'm tracking him now. Um, but some of them stayed in Matanzas in a little town that was called San Agustin de la Nueva Florida, St. Augustine of the New Florida. And, and now, in Spanish, they call it Ceiba Mocha. It's a little teeny, teeny town uh, that is like time stop. Russian tractors and 1950s cars and ration cards for food and that kind of thing. But nice people, wonderful people that remembered me when I went back last summer. I was walking down the street. Uh, I had been there, remember, in 1991 as a student. <laughs> and I'm walking down the street, and a man is coming down the street. And he goes, Janie. And it was the doctor from the town that I had brought supplies and medicine to when I went there the first time. So they really don't have a lot happening <laughs> in that town. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a little map we did at the museum to show the exodus to Florida, I mean to Cuba. So 1763, you may remember some of your history. Uh, the uh, British win the Seven Years' War, and they get some pieces of what used to be Spanish territory. They get Manila in the Philippines, and they get Florida. And so the people who were raised as Catholics, and especially my black Catholics, do not want to stay when the English are going to come back in and bring that Anglo-American chattel racial slavery in. So they and the Christian Indians also, most of them, take the, uh, the invitation to go to Cuba and go with all the rest of the community to Cuba. Who's already in Cuba at that point? Oh, the Spanish have had Cuba since the early 1500s. So it's a regular, big, huge Spanish colony with another big fort, like I showed you for St. Augustine. It was called the Pearl of the Antilles by the Spanish at one time, the Key to the Indies <coughs> another time. It sits out there also where those silver fleets have to go by. So it's their big military base. And my guys are a smaller military base, and they go in and out of Havana a lot. So they already knew Havana. They knew some of the people there. It wasn't such a uh, horrible outcome. In fact, it's going to a better place than St. Augustine was in those days. 
And so I started looking in baptismal records, as I said, with some of this money. These are some of the earliest ones that we have in, for any Africans in the Ameri Americas anywhere. Um, 16th century, and these are from the Havana Cathedral. This is what some of the ones I was trying to save in Matanzas look like. It's shards. Mm -hmm. And we go as far as we can, as safely as we can, and then at some point I have to make a notation. We can't turn any more pages. And, um, but it's a fairly formulaic entry, too. On such and such a day, I, Father, so-and-so, baptized so-and-so, and it'll say uh, the race. If it's an African person, they'll say the ethnic designation, which is the most important thing about identity for me that I'm tracking, whether you're uh, Lukumi or you're Congo-Angola or you're Mandinga, like my Francisco Menendez is a Mandinga man. So that gives us a lot of information that people hadn't had before about exactly what areas of Africa came these people from. Yes, sir. So um, how many people are we talking about? How, you know, For what? Um, that were baptized or okay. become a part of? I planted him in the audience because <laughs> Our records are now up, we have about 400,000 records now. And on a baptismal page, if I'm being just real you know, cautious, I'll say four to five entries. Sometimes they write real small, and a lot of them could be as many as eight. But if I say only four or five per page times 400,000, I've got four to six million Africans recorded here that we would have no other way. So, and anybody can sit at their computer if you can read this stuff. Now that's a trick. You have to, <laughs> have to learn to read it. So I'm paying grad students of mine now to do transcriptions of this old paleography, they call it, that manuscript writing in Spanish and Portuguese. And it's, we'll get some of those up. We're getting some of those up so that people can read it at least in a typed form. And, uh, but my primary directive is saving it. And so digitizing has to come first. And if I only have so much of a life left, that's what I'll do with it. And I'll try to find money for other people to do the other parts. And so after all those years of working, starting out at Florida and doing all over the world in these sketchy places that I told you about, I finally talked the Catholic Church into letting me go back to St. Augustine and digitize those records. And uh, it's a wonderful place to work, of course. Beautiful St. Augustine, great food on the water. The, the nuns had the, everything in boxes nicely kept, air conditioning I had, I had electricity, I had food and a bathroom, <laughs> all this stuff. So it was a real easy place to work, but they can't read this stuff. And so the boxes were all mixed up because at one point all those records had gone to Havana. And somebody later down the road in the 20th century got the Havana church to return it but it came back in boxes and people didn't know how to organize it and it's all mixed up. So it took us a lot of time to organize it, to film it in order. And um, so it's been done now. And so now St. Augustine's records are the oldest for what is our country, the US. And they start in the 1590s for Africans and Indians. So a real treasure. And it's the Catholic Church that let me do it. So, and helped me bring a couple of my students down there to do it and to train some other students. We always train students, so we make sure there's a new generation coming that'll be doing it. And that's what some of them look like, some of the records. Unfortunately, a lot of people that were trying to save records stuck them in plastic covers, which is terrible, terrible, terrible. You don't do that. But um, they meant well, and so that eats up stuff too. And so that's the website. It's called, we started out with ecclesiastical sources for slave societies, and then we started doing notarial records and anything else we found as well. So we had to have, add another S. It's not easy to say. And my dean jokes, E, S to the fourth. <laughs> so, um, but this is the site. If you, uh, if you just Google ESSSS, how many S's with that? I don't know. You'll find it, and you can get on it. And we also try to take, you know, images of the art or the photographs or whatever we can to add to it. We're uploading maps to try to orient people about it. We're trying to put up some church histories to tell about it. Uh, so slowly but surely, we're adding, you know, more interesting things to it. But again, the primary directive is make sure these records aren't 
lost. And then just to plug, these are the things that I've done with all those records if anybody's interested later. This? These are my books so far. Well, one of them isn't up there as a textbook, but uh, the first book, I remember the, the Mina Man with the Scarification. That's the first book, so that's my dissertation book, basically. Uh, that one was a wonderful collection that I got other people to write as well as I wrote one. I wrote uh, Free Black Homesteaders and Property Owners in, in St. Augustine and the farms they developed and so on. And then I asked everybody to also give me a document to show others how to do this history. And um, Against the Odds was the first one. I did another one like that then in for Latin America, Slave Subjects Subversives. And each one's a different part of the Latin American world. I did one on Mexico and a runaway slave community, a maroon community. And then I put the, for my document, I chose their demands for peace. And they say what they will do if the Spaniards will stop attacking them. And it's handwritten, and I found it in the archives in Mexico. Say that, say that again. The, the, the runaway slave mm -hmm. demands for peace? Yes. Or? Yes, they tell the governor, if you want to you know, finally have peace here, you will do X, Y, and Z. And it's got 11 conditions in it. And one is, you know, first of all, I and my heirs will run this town forever. We'll be a, a free black town like my Mosey. Mm -hmm. And we won't raid anymore, and we won't, uh, you know, we'll be Spanish subjects. We'll come to your defense if you need it. But I want it, pr you know, for my heirs. And so they gave him that, Yanga Town. You can go and see it today in Mexico. It's on the, wet, on the Caribbean coast, Orizaba area, and out near Veracruz. And so, and then he said, and, um, we don't want any Spanish in here except maybe on market days. <laughs> and they say, <laughs> market days, okay, Tuesday. <laughs> and then uh, they say which priest they want, which order they want, and all of these kinds of things. And so I just love that document. I used that one. But other people picked other kinds of documents, so wills or um, inventories or all kinds of things. And everybody did a different part. And um, because I now work a lot out of this project, I've worked a lot with the Africanist scholars. I asked the two most important African scholars, two, Paul Lovejoy and John Thornton, to give me a chapter about uh, first early Islamic Africa and then Congo Angola, and for them to give me a document too. And so this was the first textbook that linked Africa to the Latin America at least. And then uh, this one was my most recent one, and I had so many of these great characters like Francisco Menendez that I had been collecting for 20 years on these people, little scraps here and there. And one wonderful guy is Jorge Biasu, George Biasu, who helped launch the Haitian slave revolt. Uh, Toussaint did not. You all know Toussaint Louverture. He was, he was a free man, first of all, and he didn't come in on the revolt until he decided it might actually happen. Um, but Bookman starts it, and he's killed three, man, three months in, and Georges Biasu is one of those that picked up the, the fight early. And so, lo and behold, after they finally start to lose, France and Spain cut a deal, and he had been a big military figure for the Spanish eventually after he thought he was going to lose to the French and he goes off to Florida. So you can visit his house there now if you want. And um, I don't know if any of you saw that Skip Gates, Africans in the, in the Americas kind of documentary recently. Mm -hmm. We did a little filming there at Mose and at the house of Georges Biasu. And uh, when I first wrote about him as a grad student, <laughs> everybody condemned me for writing about bloodthirsty you know, rebels and blah, blah, blah. And in the, the little St. Augustine newspaper was called The Record, but everybody jokes The Wretched. And they, <laughs> they cut out clippings and sent it to me because this man was ranting about me writing about this character and as if I were going to instigate race war or something. And um, he compared me to Muammar Gaddafi, which is so funny <laughs> that everybody sent me that <laughs> clipping. And so, but now his house is a, 
a tourist site, and you can go visit it, and he's all over the map. And so Georges Biasu, and he, he dies there after fighting the Seminoles, defending Spanish against the Seminoles, and being a major military figure in St. Augustine as well, having his own command and so on. And uh, he died, and so I have the inventory of everything he left, and um, his extended family, the people that came out of San Domingue with him. He eventually sent his wife and his sister back to Cuba because it was a bigger, better place, actually, than St. Augustine. So there's lots of trails to still follow for him and for the others that continue to fight on uh, for the Spanish in Florida, even though they began their lives as slaves in San Domingue under the French. So one little tiny place, just because Florida juts out there in the Caribbean, has had all of these crisscrosses of English and French and Spanish and pirates and Africans and Indians, and you can get a nice little multicultural kind of thing right out of that one little tiny place. So yes, ma'am. Are there families living there now in Mose that know their history and can trace it back, that are aware of it? No, because they went to Cuba. Cuba. Okay. And so in the Cubans, because of the weird political thing, the first time I went there, they didn't know anything about it either, and they had a myth that. Uh, San Agustin de la Nueva Florida was founded by Canary Islanders. There were a lot of them, but they didn't know anything about the African uh, contingent there. But, but the other stuff I wrote about in black society, some of those families were quite uh, impressive families, and some of those people do trace their history because they stayed under the Americans eventually. And so the, the important planters in the community all had black families as well as white families and sometimes they serve as godparents for one another and everybody knows it in the community and and even if they die without a will the community upholds the right of those children to have property and so on and have they stayed within the catholic church um well you know i can't swear that all of them have one of the women i met descended from some of those families is a dance anthropologist and um I didn't ask her if she was a Catholic, but she's a professor of dance anthropology, and one of the other brothers is a judge in California, and one of the others ran in those Nazi Olympics with, was it Jesse Owens? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the families that were related to these Spanish families had a leg up. They start with property and education and freedom and so on, and some of them still own chunks of pretty important Florida land out there. But just the ones that went to Cuba, I don't know. Just to get the women's side in that yes. German Olympics, so Wilma Rudolph ran. Oh, okay. Thank you. I didn't know that. I'll put that together. Another prominent person. Um, so anyway, that's the story of the first free black town in what is today the United States. But I found earlier ones when I started looking in other parts of Latin America. I have a free black town in Venezuela, 1603 because they had found some gold out there and the Spaniards keep getting defeated by the Indians and so they say to the free black community, if you can hold it, you can have it, and they do. And so way down the road in 18th century, whites started trying to move in there and they complained to the Spanish crown and the Spanish crown said, yes, you have the right to be the officials of that town and hold all the offices and so on. So there are some earlier examples, but um, there are a lot more than than I thought they were. I thought I was unique, but I'm not. It's good news. <laughs> this, way, excuse me, this might be way off track, but because your focus is thinking deep, deep thinking back, mm -hmm. but based on this stark difference between the Spanish law and the English law in, in terms of slaves and race, when you go to these formerly Spanish places, do you see a world of difference in terms of um, no racial conflict versus what's happened here? I, I don't want to make it sound so rosy. So during this time period, it is like this. What changes things sometimes, and what changed it in Cuba and in Brazil where it started out like this, mm -hmm. is the introduction of large-scale capital development of plantations mm -hmm. and sugar. By white people. Yeah. There are some free black families that also own plantations, but mostly it's a white plantation system. Um, 
So the English, of course, were about property. We already said that they tried first indigo didn't work in Carolina, then finally rice is a crop and so on. You find crops, tobacco in Virginia, cotton becomes a real big one in the U.S. South. But the biggest killer of all was sugar. And so Cuba and Brazil are on sugar. There's a little phrase in Spanish in, in, in for Cuba, sugar is made with blood because the sugar cane, uh, you know, juice comes up and you have to cut right then. And it's 12 hours in the field till it's done. And it's just brutal, brutal, brutal. So, but it's making a lot of money. And when San Domingue blew up, that was, that little third of an island was the richest colony in the whole of the Americas. One little third that's today poor, impoverished Haiti. It was running the show. But when the big revolt happened and they burn out all the plantations there, all those planters flee. And that means a new wave, a new generation of sugar. And Cuba starts big time sugar then. And so where are they getting all the people to work in the sugar cane? Those Spaniards aren't going to do it. And my free black elites who live in the city aren't going to do it either. They start an African slave trade very late. Uh, and you know, the U.S. supposedly gave it up in 1808. And I say supposedly, because all up in the Atlantic and the Gulf Coast, they're slipping them in. Um, but Cuba is Spanish still, and they keep bringing waves and waves and waves from Africa in. And so does Brazil start bringing in. And so to keep people in the, in the fields, you cannot offer these outs. You cannot let them know about the law and the church and the rights to go to the court. And the, you just put them out in the boondocks as soon as you can and don't let them hear about it. So they, the Spanish, which was supplying Cuba, were treating the Africans, capturing them and kidnapping them exactly like the, the English. Yeah, they got into it late, but they get into it. And one of the families, uh, and Baltimore is one of the big places that's providing the ships for this late trade. So I have friends in Baltimore that are tracking certain ships. I'm trying to help them with that. Um, there's a wonderful, if you all are interested, a wonderful other database uh, for everybody to use called the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database. And you can track ships or captains. And, but it's pretty much from the English side, they've started filling in some of the Spanish stuff. Um, and again, from property records, insurance records for shipping and that kind of stuff. Yes, uh, sir. You, you mentioned uh, you know, the movement to Cuba mm -hmm. at one moment that uh, people were given land grants yes. and seeds. Yes. And uh, even supplied with the slave to help out. Mm -hmm. um, what was the calendar window that happened? Well, um, you know, they get them when they go there in 1763, these land grants. And then I, can tr I track them for a while on that trail where they're all trying to pay back their debt to the crown, becoming just regular subjects of the king in this little boondock town. Um, but, you know, the people that were already free and already had property and connections, you know, the idea about money whitening, supposedly, and family connections in, in the Latin world mean more almost, and education, and how you dress, and if you're a good Catholic. And, and so these families that I have tracked for generations, or centuries maybe, in Cuba, when that sugar crunch comes, those free black urban people start getting oppressed too. And some of them fought in our American Revolution. The black militias of Havana are in all those Gulf campaigns, in the Mississippi River campaigns. They get decorated for their heroism. You may have heard of Bernardo de Galvez, who comes up from Cuba with a whole group of uh, militias and boats and storms up there and helps the Americans win their independence. My guys are on that ship, and I can tell you who was on, on those ships mm -hmm. and where they served. And then they also are doing more corsairing in that American Revolutionary period. They're also in the War of 1812. They're all over the place. So generations of freedom that are going to take a hit once capitalist development and it becomes racialized. Those slaves in the field are the Africans who are not cultured, not in their view, not Catholic, not literate, not dressing right, all of that. So pretty soon everybody who's black gets sort of crunched down by that system as capital development happens. So it's a sort of, so my last book, here I have all these rebels that fought. I did one guy, wonderful big guy, big Prince Whitten is my American revolutionary guy. 
He runs from South Carolina and comes into St. Augustine. He becomes the hero of the black militia. He fights the U.S. Marines in a covert war in 1812, fights Indians, pirates, whatever, and ends up taking his community off to Cuba again when the Americans take, first we had the British take Florida. Nobody wants to stay with them. And nobody wants to stay with the Americans either because they're coming in with those same ideas. And so another exodus in 1821, and in that one I track Big Prince and his family all down. And he's also not literate, but his children were. And they were raised in those schools and they write for him. And so I have Prince, I have George Biasu for the Haitian Revolt. I have uh, a very interesting Abraham Black Seminole who uh, tries to help the state of Muskogee create a free state in that time period. And so all of these revolutionary characters, I picked one for each one and did it sort of as a little mini biographies to talk about the era. Yeah, on the slave owner idea mm -hmm. uh, and the Civil War, or the Revolutionary War, excuse me. Yes. Uh, there was a, a slave in Framington, uh, Massachusetts, Framingham, Massachusetts. Uh, the, he was the second owner of a slave. And uh, the slave owner said, I will free you if you will fight in the military in the Revolutionary War. And uh, uh, Peter, uh, Peter Salem is the slave's name. Okay. So he's freed. He fights in the Revolutionary War. He fights in Saratoga. Wow. Uh, and he fights in Bunker Hill. He fires the first shot at Bunker Hill. Is he recorded somewhere? Because I don't look up north. <laughs> but I mean, but they know is, about him, recorded. obviously. Oh, yeah. He's recorded, yeah. Very good. I mean, it's, this is February's uh, <clears throat> Black that, History Month. Yeah, right? so, that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, there was also uh, somebody I know in New Jersey that they've written a book about Captain Ty, who joined the American forces too, was a black revolutionary for the American side. And of course, everybody, Crispus Attucks, who gets Yeah, that's, that's the one that most people remember. Yeah, and yeah. But I think there's plenty, plenty, plenty more that we don't mm -hmm. know about. Yes. Um, and so some of them end up with the Patriots. Some of them end up with the Loyalists, because the British end up copying the Spanish idea of we could use these military mm -hmm. helpers. And so late in the game, they will start to incorporate Africans into their troops, too. So they become the black Loyalists. And they get spread out when the British lose. Some of them go to London. And so they leave trails about what they did, too, and how you can. Some of them go to the Bahamas. Some of them go to Nova Scotia. Eventually, Liberia and Sierra Leone sometimes in these colonization movements. Well, so. George Washington recruited slaves to fight the revolution. Did he? He recruited blacks. On purpose. Yeah, soldier. good. Yeah. So see, it is more common than we yeah, think. Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, good. I'm going to have to, in another life, I'll start working on the North. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, what you, you mentioned you're, you're expanding your view now from, uh, from Brazil and, and, and Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, all parts are just the uh, west well, the, coast of Africa? Or? Mostly the west coast of Africa. Yeah. It's really hard to work in Angola now. My, I did send one of my grad students there because there was a group going. I knew she would be safe and have you know, somebody to work with. But um, the last place I went, and I've pitched it, and I hope I get some help for this, is to Cape Verde, uh, Cabo Verde, on 200 miles off the coast of Senegal, which was the first slave trading place from Senegal out to the Cape Verde Islands. And from there, they'd go into the Caribbean, Hispaniola mostly, which is Dominican Republic. And so um, I was there uh, in October, and the American Embassy sort of helped pay some of my way. And um, I'm now the US representative for the UNESCO Tracking the Slave Route project. And so my charge is to document more places of slavery, importance to slavery, or resistance. And so I thought, well, we got to start with Cape Verde. I'll also get all my folks on, on the stick, all the Saint, um, Fort Mose Historical Society. I'm going to give them the paperwork to start it, and then I'll help them and everywhere else that I can get this going. But um, I'm going to try to take a, two other Portuguese speakers of my grad students with me to Cape Verde a little bit this summer sometime. The yes. reason I was asking about that is you had slave ships leave from the east coast of Africa, too, yes. in Madagascar. Right. 
And then the ones that came from Madagascar, that's a whole Are you a historian? No, <laughs> I, just, I, I planted him. History, as well, we call good it. for you, good. <laughs> that's true, and not many people know that. And I wish I'd known this uh, many, many years ago, because at one time I roomed with a person from Madagascar, and I could have learned a lot of this stuff. I've never been there. Good. I'd love to go there. Vanderbilt has a, a medical uh, outreach program on HIV AIDS in Mozambique but I've never been to either of those sites. But I do get Mozambican slaves in, in the Caribbean as well. So you're right, they do. In fact, if you all want in another fun book to read is, uh, or two, uh, my wonderful old friend from North Florida, Dan Schaefer, Daniel Schaefer, S-C-H-A-F-E-R. His first book was about Anna Magigini Jai Kingsley, African princess and planter, mistress of the plantation kind of thing. And she really was. She was a Senegalese woman whose family was involved in slave trade. She gets caught up and captured and is in Cuba. It's a wonderful little book. And he and I went to Senegal to track her trail because she got taken to Cuba as a young girl, 13, something like that. And this very important Scottish Quaker slave trader and coffee trader, uh, Zephaniah Kingsley, bought her and brings her back to Amelia Island. Yes, like you remember that? Yes, you've the you've been there? Isn't that neat? Saw her home. Yes. And they've done archaeology there, and I've been involved with that project a long time. And she runs the show while he's all over the world, and eventually he dies. And um, so that's another one of those families. And then now he's just done a new book on Zephaniah himself. So that would fill in some of this history uh, as well. But we went to Senegal to look for her family, and it uh, went all into the interior, a little place called Yang Yang, and that's where she was from. And so there's, he's been all over Scotland looking for their trails before he wrote these books, and we went to Senegal and England, and it takes a lot of travel miles to get this done, but those are two wonderful books about that same kind of time period. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you.